Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MyCon Podcast. I'm Sean Kimbaloye. The MyCon Podcast runs independently from my weekday show on China's television, which is Politics Today, as well as the weekend edition, Sunday Politics. Now, let's get straight to the point today. Like most of my guests on this show, no long introductions needed. They are known, influential, and uh, stir up conversations. My guest today is Senator Ned Nwoko, representing Delta North and the 10th National Assembly. The Senator weighed in on different issues of national interest, ranging from an amendment bill proposed to allow civilians bear firearms for self defense to how he thinks social media should be handled. It was a no old bad conversation. Of course, we also spoke about the senator's love interest. He's married to Nollywood actress Regina Daniels and other things it does when he's not proposing a deal. Without letting the cat out of the bag, sit back and watch this exciting conversation. We've been joined on the MyCom podcast today by a very well-known uh, lawmaker, federal lawmaker from Delta State, Senator Ned Ungoko joins us on the MyCon podcast. Thank you so much, distinguished, for joining us today. Thank you. It's a Thank pleasure you. having you. you. And interestingly, we're having it in the comfort of your home. <laughs> this is in the midst of all of the conversation with your colleagues over constituency projects uh, in the National Assembly. Let me, for, for, first and foremost, you're a lawyer. Uh, who's practiced in the UK and all what have you, but there are established uh, judgments of court about whether or not um, the Senate or the National Assembly can actually uh, take or suspend a lawmaker. What's your view as a lawyer on, on that front? Of course, uh, within our rules, uh, like the rules of any other assembly, uh, any member can be suspended on proving misconduct um, as to whether this particular situation of a ningi amounts to uh, misconduct is is yet to be seen um, I, I i think uh, generally um, that we, we run a democratic uh, system and i think that there should be more opportunities for people to be tried fairly, you know. But the majority uh, have said what they wanted, and so it has happened. Uh, but as to whether the, the, the um, Senate has a right to do that, of course they do, within our rules, you know. And then those who say, I mean, the case of Omar Gege, the case of uh, mm. Aline Dume, the case of uh, Dino Melaye, these established judgments of court to say you cannot deprive the constituency of the representation in the National Assembly, which means that at the moment when such a lawmaker is absent, the interest of that constituency so is first. absent. So that those who say whatever decision uh, to send uh, Ningi home is ultra virus, is against the position of the Constitution of Nigeria. Yeah. Well, what you must also understand is that uh, yes, yeah, yes, he has been suspended, but there was a, a proviso that if he writes and apologizes, that he'll be recalled. So he could be recalled next week, for instance, if he writes and admits his wrongs. Um, as to whether uh, we are you know, following a, or we're doing some, something against the uh, court decisions on such matters, um, I don't think we are. Um, I don't think we are. You know, this is an internal mechanism that has been followed. You think you, he deserves? Nengi deserves what he got? No, I, no, no, not that he deserves what he got. You know, I was not really appraised of the facts of the case uh, because it was more or less a northern senators' issues. They were meeting with the Senate President and and some of his leaders but there, there there is some substance in what he said and he he actually repeated it on the floor of the senate that about three point something trillion naira were not located within specific projects 
And that is important. And so I think that we ought to have set up a committee to try and identify those projects, know exactly what happened, is whether what Ningi is saying is true or not. You know, that is something that we ought to have done and something that I think we, we should still do at, at some time in the future. You need you know, to scrutinize oh, yes. some of the facts in there. Oh, yes. Because the details in uh, projects, I mean, uh, items at the um, um, INEC uh, and a few other items were not totaling about $3 trillion. Details, even the National Assembly budget, mm -hmm. no, it has not, the details was not provided. Mm -hmm. And that those who said transparency is very key yeah. in the activities of the parliament mm. as a responsibility to the people of Nigeria. Yes. So as I said, I, I hope and I do wish that uh, there will be a time when we'll have the opportunity to identify those projects and, and see whether there's some truth in what he said or he was just... Uh, uh, but but, but do you subscribe, talking. though, the manner in which this con the value of the constituency project are being shared? And uh, someone like Senator Jari has said, these things are not even. Uh, some senators got, uh, some leaders got about 500 million, some got 250, some got 300. Uh, what, how, how many of those value went to your constituency, Senator? I believe that um, the way things are done, uh, currently, especially uh, the, with the last two budgets, including the supplementary budget of last year, were not done properly. You know, um, the, the fact remains that most senators get what they want or what they, what they lobby for not because they have a, a right to it you know so everybody simply just goes about <clears throat> doing what they can do for their constituencies for their senatorial districts um, although the, 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 the better approach would have been for some kind of uniformity you know so if they say that every senatorial district should get a project of about a constituency project of about one billion then so be it that it should be but this way um, the way it's done now, you just basically rely on your on your wits and, and your contacts to see what you can get for your people. So it's a case of uh, all animals are equal, but more are more equal than the others. Yeah, That's what it looks, it's looking like. Well, uh, it's just the system. It's just the system. But does that sit well with you? Well, it's, it's a system in, in Nigeria, you know. You, you just, as I said, I would have preferred a situation where we all know what we are getting for our constituency. You don't need to lobby for it. And it is a standard thing. Every, every of the 109 senators should know from the outset what is going to their particular district. And it should be published. We're not talking about money for the senators, per se. It's not money for us. So the money doesn't go to your pocket? No, 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 no. This is for projects within our senatorial district, you know, that totaling whatever it is. So if you have roads, if you have uh, water projects, you have uh, uh, training programs, all should, you know, aggregate to a particular amount. Um, and most of us, like myself, I'm not really concerned about who the contractor is or who is doing it. I just want those projects to be done for my constituency. I heard this, uh, the Deputy Senate President say on the floor, uh, Senator Barao uh, re making reference to you uh, when you were trying to move, uh, uh, you, you spoke about a particular issue and he said, look, Senator Naidunwoko is very well connected. He can meet these people and attract some of these things. How much of this project are you able to attract to the people of your constituency? A lot. A lot because I, I just... what value? Just as, did, uh, did you get as much as some of the leaders, 500 million? Of course, yes. You got up to that? I've got more than that, you know, uh, for my people. I mean, that's why I am who I am, you know. So you got up to a billion? Of course, I, I did. But these are projects for my people. You know, and that's why I'm here. And if I'm not able to lobby for my people, and let me tell you this, uh, the Senate President doesn't interfere with this. 
the leadership of, of Senate don't they don't interfere with this. You just simply know what your people want, and and you go for it. You you go to the discuss with the ministers, you discuss with the uh, DGs or whoever it is that's in charge, and make sure that you get, or even uh, chairman of committees, you know, you talk to them, you lobby them. And so if I'm not able to lobby my, my colleagues or fellow Nigerians to make sure that certain projects are done in my constituency, then why am I here? You know, I mean, of course, the primary duty of every lawmaker is to make laws for the good governance of Nigeria, which I'm doing, which I'm doing very well. I'm sure you've seen the list of bills and motions. But beyond that, you, you know, we're, we're expected to do other things, you know, use our own money to support our people, which I've done. Uh, but in terms of projects, this is something that should be done. Um, either I lobby the state governor or the state commissioners or federal ministries or agencies or the ministers. You know, these are things that every senator should do. We don't just you know, fold our arms and um, you know, expect Babio to give us, to spoon, spoon feed us. Um, I, I don't do that. And I, I just carry on with what I have to do. You know. let, let, let's go into areas uh, which, some of the areas that are quite a bit controversial, which are your position on national issues that you have voiced out on the either on the floor or outside of the floor of, of the Senate. Maybe I should start with security before I go into economy, because on the economy, I know how passionate you are with some of the issues. You are proposing that... Um, because of the kidnappings and some of the violent criminal activities in the country, uh, you have uh, asked that Nigerians must be allowed to bear arms. Yeah. But there are those who will say that will simply lead to chaos. What was your intention? What did you think? Because you made reference to the United States, for example. Mm -hmm. There are those who will say, if you look at the statistics of the death leading to people bearing arms in the United States, there are people are agitating that... People uh, carrying carriage of arms in the United States should uh, be, be stopped. But you are now proposing such a thing in Nigeria. Yeah. Do you think that might be counterproductive? I will come to the American situation uh, later. But let me tell you this. Uh, there is all, there's chaos already in Nigeria. Every day you hear of kidnaps, uh, kidnappings here and there across the nation. There are proliferation of illegal weapons everywhere. There are many armed, illegally armed groups across the space of Nigeria. Whether you like it or not, you know, you would have come across one or two people kidnapped or hurt simply because they were vulnerable. My senior legislative aide was kidnapped and killed uh, in November. I was told the circumstances in which the kidnappers went from house to house in his estate in Gala Demawa, part of Abuja. Let me tell you, if some of those guys, and they are very reasonable guys. My, my SLA was a lawyer for over 10 years. You know, if a guy like him had a gun, a licensed gun, he wouldn't have been picked like a chicken the way he was picked. If he had a gun, or people in his streets had guns, but they didn't. And the only thing that those kidnappers had were just guns. There were, there were a few of them that had guns. And you've seen many public transports on our highways stopped and everybody told to come down and they are led into the bush. And you, some, some of them, you never hear from them again, simply because nobody amongst them had a gun. And the story is the same all over in Nigeria. Uh, what my bill seeks to do is to give the opportunity 
to those who want to have guns to have them. And those, it's not, it's not, a, it's not just because you have a license doesn't mean that you must have a gun. You know, there are many, many people who have licenses to drive cars that don't have cars. I'm sure you know that. Mm. Um, and, and this compares with what is happening in America. In America, the law allows everybody to bear arms. Everybody. When I say everybody, those who are American, right. who are, are Americans, it's a basic fundamental right. That's not what I'm talking about here. Here, I am saying that there are stages that you must go through to be able to qualify to bear arms. One of them is that you must go through a shooting range school. You must be trained on how to handle guns. And that school should be able to give you some certificate that you've gone through such a training program. And that school should be, or my proposal is that there should be one of such schools in every senatorial district. And they should be owned and run by retired military guys who are familiar with guns. And so by the time you leave that place, now able to use a gun, you go to your traditional ruler who will write to confirm that they know you and that you are a person of good character. Because whether you like it or not, every character in our society is known by the local kings. Mm -hmm. And if the kings don't know, their chiefs know. If, you know, there's a council of chiefs for every community. So, and they know those families where people are known as rogues. They, they're known as thieves. They're known as, as, uh, as uh, um, uh, the, the history of every family is known yeah. to the traditional uh, rulers. And so for me, that is a very important vetting. Yeah. And then from there, you must get two reports from medical doctors, two medical doctors that will confirm that you, you are of sound, sound, mind. Sound, sound mind. And those doctors must be your doctors, not just, you can't just go to any odd doctor and get a, some certification. They must be doctors who have known you for at least two years. That's a condition. Then from there, you go to the local government chairman who will also certify that they know you, that you are from that local government. Then lastly, you go to the commission of police and the director uh, DSS in the state to get your final confirmations. And with this now, you go back to the shooting range school who should be the people selling those guns. Um, because as I said, there will be license, there's special license, because if you go to America or some, even UK, you know, you have shops that, that sell guns. Supermarkets. Um, you know, there's, 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 stores, there's, there's, yeah, there's, stores they sell them everywhere. Easy. So yeah. I, what I'm saying that those retired military guys should also be licensed to sell guns. Well, here's the yeah. issue, Senator. Yeah. Uh, in the ownership of firearm in Nigeria, there are mm -hmm. those who believe that um, there is already proliferation mm -hmm. of firearms. I know what you're talking about. Illegal so let me tell you. Courage. So what do you suggest in the alternative? Do you look... The military are overstretched and they are under equipped. The police are insufficient in all ramifications. You know, when you look at the number of policemen that we have, we currently we need about no less than four hundred thousand new recruits immediately. We only have about three hundred and fifty thousand policemen. And that, that is nothing for a population of over two hundred million people. We have the money to be yeah. able to employ more yes, police officers yes, and yes, pay them. Yes, so, so if you don't have the money, if you don't have the money, Sheon, there are a lot of people defend themselves. It's as it, simple as that. It is, look at this. You, if you are speaking for the government and yeah. you say the, the government doesn't have the money to, to, to uh, recruit more uh, uh, policemen, and there are many people who want to be uh, recruited, um, then allow people to defend themselves. Th th about 300 and 327 people are said to be shot dead daily on the street of the United States. Mm -hmm. 
based on the fact that people carry firearms. Yeah, but you, but, but again, you, 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 you confuse the USA situation with Nigeria situation. As I told you before, in America, people walk into any shop and buy any gun they like, isn't it? In, that is not what we are proposing here. And in America, you know, for crying out loud, as you guys say here, um, you know, uh, they have emergency response systems. In America, if you are in a dire situation, what you can do easily is to dial the emergency number. I think it's 911 or something like that. 911. Yeah, you, you dial 911 in America. Even if you don't talk, Sharon, in five minutes, they will locate where you are. In, in five minutes, the police will, will be there. In five minutes, uh, the fire service will be there. In five minutes, the, the, the ambulance will be there. All those three emergency services. And we don't have that. We don't have emergency response systems to back up people's, I mean, government must provide for the people. You know, uh, security is number one. If you can't do that, then people should be able to... Do, do, do you have a sense, Anita? I mean, you are UK trained. Uh, you, you have some uh, UK blood running through your veins in that sense. Uh, and, uh, I mean, being in that system, does it give you a sense that we, we are perhaps living in almost a failed state with all the indices, economic indices, security indices, uh, human capital development, all of the indices that make... That, 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 that points to how a normal human being should live under the normal United Nations indices, statistics. No, Do you no. think we're probably drifting to a failed state? I love Nigeria. I love Nigeria and I love what we have. We have tremendous good people everywhere. We have resources that many countries would dream of having. We have the best weather you can uh, imagine. Look, governance, good governance is, is something that has eluded us for so long. And for this to happen, we, we really need people that are selfless. We need people who will think less of themselves and more, more of the public. Um, I wouldn't subscribe to the idea that we are a failed state or we are... Nigeria is, is a big country by any stretch of your imagination. Uh, Nigeria is... I mean, I am proud of my country, Nigeria, you know, in, in, in so many uh, ways. I, I just feel that we need to put our acts together. There are some things that must be done to make things different in Nigeria. You know, for me, whether it's an APC government or PDP government, they're all the same, really. Really? Uh, yes. no, no difference. No difference, because every government that comes in is talking about the same. They're talking about removal of subsidy. They're talking about uh, paying of salaries. They're talking about building one road or the other, boreholes here and there, paying salaries. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a, a nation where we are economically independent, where we look inwards, where we begin to grow our economy as a nation, where we can begin to, you know, refine our natural resources, produce and manufacture from within, and you know where we don't have to import anymore, virtually everything. You know, I remember many years ago when I went to South Korea. You know, South Korea was just like Nigeria of Nigeria of today. But you go back to Korea now, you see that they have managed to copy many things from China, from Japan, from America, um, and they become self-sufficient uh, without all the natural resources. And you can say you know so about Singapore. Yep. Say so about uh, several other countries. Of course, several Even other countries. Several, several, countries. several other countries. So yeah. we, we, we were in the same level yeah. at about that time. But look at where we are today. You're right. So, so Would so, you say it's a failure of leadership? Well, I, I've said that much. But what we need to do, we need to stop importation of goods of any type. 
Really? Oh yes. You the, think the government the, should the, ban. The, oh yes. Oh yes. You know the people who are importing goods are less than 0.2 percent of the population. For example, uh, there are many more manufacturers, manufacturers and producers. We are about 30 percent. It's a huge number. So whatever efforts we want to make to encourage local production and manufacturing, we must do it without wasting time. Do you think that the president, the President Balatinobu, has that political will to say all produ products in this category should be banned? Well, he has the guts. I, you know, I know he has the guts that he can do it and damn the consequence. And he will do it for the interest of Nigerians. And when Nigerians see that he's doing it for their interest, they will support him. And, but he has to go one step further. He must also prohibit the use of foreign currencies in Nigeria. He must begin to understand that the idea of having a parallel market in Nigeria is an anomaly. The fact that we have uh, the use of dollars everywhere in, in paying foreign workers in Nigeria, in, in uh, paying for some rented accommodations, in paying for, or even that people have uh, dumb accounts, all that should be stopped, you know. Dumb accounts should be closed? Oh, of course, yes. They should be converted into Naira. Every account should be converted into Naira. We must begin to promote our Naira. Until you do so, all these things about uh, increasing in interest rate, and it just I means no more. It just it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, it just doesn't it work. work. Because, uh, you know, uh, Nigeria is not a normal country. It's not a normal society. You know, in a normal society, you can increase your interest rate to as a way of uh, discouraging more, more expenditure or more borrowing. Do you understand that? Or you can reduce interest rate to encourage borrowing, uh, as the case may be. But in Nigeria, we, we, we don't have the money to, I mean, the, the people, the people, the consumers are not able to borrow. Nobody's borrowing because interest rate is way above what the normal person can, um, can service. So we don't have money. Consumers don't have money. So the idea that people should be able to, uh, uh, you know, shouldn't be, shouldn't be borrowing is it's, it's, it's a misnomer because they are not borrowing anyway. People are not borrowing. And there's no, people are not spending. But above all, there are no goods. Goods have been hoarded within the, 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 the various uh, um, systems. So what we need to do is not about increasing interest rate. We must make the economy as, look, let, me, let me just go back to what I, what I was saying before. It's not about just the, getting the um, uh, people to start spending money because there, there isn't, the average, Nigerians are not paid enough. Mm. We don't have the, 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 you know, the spending power in Nigeria. And that is a major, major problem. As I said, because the interest rates are high, people are not, we don't have an, a, a credit economy where people can go and borrow money. Every system, whether it's in America or UK or France, they base, everything is run on, on credit. People borrow. But banks here don't do normal banking because they found a way of making money through buying and selling of dollars. You know, they've more or less bastardized the economy. So the banking sector is a major problem. Of course, it is. It's a, I could probably say there about 40% of the problem of Nigeria. So if you remove dollars from within the system and make it compulsory for people to trade and buy things in Naira, you begin to see the effect of what I'm proposing. The, what we need to do, when, when that is done, for example, the sale of oil, the sale of gas, the sale of whatever raw material we're, we're exporting now, all of them should be done in Naira. When that is done, Nigerians or non-Nigerians, uh, foreigners who are coming to Nigeria to buy things, we pay in Naira. When there's demand for Naira, the value of Naira will increase and you will see immediately that Naira will appreciate. Mm. You know, until that is done, we're just creating problems for Naira. 
you, you have well, proposed some motions on the floor of the national move some bills that are dramatic and very controversial but those are your thinking for our economy to move forward for example i one of it is for you for you when you say ban importation of uh, some items what kind of items are you talking about anything that uh, we can make here you know what do we make here? That's a question <laughs> people will ask. <laughs> what do we make in Nigeria? Especially if you want to construct a house apart from blocks yeah. and cement. What else do we do? Well, you, can, you can ban the importation of vehicles, for example, and focus on those companies that are beginning to assemble cars here. I'm sure from assembling cars here, eventually they will begin to make the parts here. You know, even if you ban the, uh, the importation of telephones, for example, from within here, Within amongst Nigerians, very soon they will start producing phones. If you go to China, something you know, uh, you know, they, you can get a phone that is cost you next to nothing, and you can also get one that's expensive, depending on on your spending power. Which is in power. Yeah, the the fact is that the 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 quality of what is being made in China depends on what you want to pay, because they can produce the uh, low quality ones and they can produce the high quality ones. In Nigeria, we can get to that point, but any government has to just be, that, that, be, be, that would cause an initial shock. It in will, it, but this is the only way we can grow. That is the only way we can become productive. But it's going to be very painful. It will be. It's but going to be a very difficult decision you and see, politically you difficult. See, so. if, if the president understands that this is the way for Nigeria to become economically independent, this is the way for Nigeria to start growing, this is the way for Nigeria to become a net exporter eventually, and this is the way to get to appreciate our 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 currency to make it globally in demand and quoted. Nigerians will back him up. Nigerians will be there for him. You see that that this government have that sense of purpose in tr trying to drive an economic policy that will be of the interest of Nigerians because the economy is in a dire strait right yes. now. I mean, they've complained about the state in which they met the CBN. I will not, of the I will economy. not speak for this government, but I can speak for, I can say that, uh, I mean, I, I know the president. So I know he has the guts. I know he can call the bluff of whosoever and do what has to be done. And this is what we need, somebody who has the courage. And I think he has the courage to do these things and make Nigeria a productive and uh you know a, a an mv of of other uh, countries within the next uh, few years you know and there's nothing that stops him from do, from doing it even if at the risk of his own re-election but time this is done and nigerians begin to feel understand his his mission and feel that it is achievable they will stand by him. Uh, one of the uh, controversial one, or uh, one that some landlords might raise eyebrow about, is the motion that you move uh, on one month rent limitation and landlord registry act. Some landlord will say, Senator Ned in Woko, here you go again. How do you want that to happen? Well, people now uh, have to pay rent uh, on a monthly basis. I mean, this is not the UK, this is not the United States. But we want to be like UK, and want to be like United States, we want to be like Britain, like uh, France and Japan. And in those countries, everybody pays rent one month in advance, not one year, and certainly not two years. Where do you expect people? You're, we're crying that people are not paid enough. You're crying that people don't have the means to buy their own homes because of interest rate. Because if people, if they're, uh, you know, if there are, if the interest rate is reasonable in Nigeria, say at three, four percent, many of these tenants will be homeowners. They will be homeowners because there'll be mortgages, there'll be finances for them to buy their own homes. And I remember when the president was campaigning, he, he assured uh, in, in one of his speeches, he, he said that uh, he will he work towards this. So we must work towards it. We must, you must understand that this is not being treated in isolation of any, everything else. We must ensure that interest rates are, are, are at such a, a, a level where people will begin to borrow, borrow to buy cars, borrow to buy houses, borrow to do things. When this is done, 
the first thing is that most of the tenants that you see will be able to save a deposit of whatever and pay to the, uh, mortgage companies and then buy their own homes. If they are in their own homes, they can be comfortable there and those homes can become a kind of a, um, use as a charge if they want to uh, borrow money. Um, as, far as, as far as landlords are concerned, I'm not going to speak for landlords. You know, um, I have my own homes, uh, you know, I have tenants and, and all that. The, the fact is that the, the law has to be changed and every landlord has to bear the brunt of it. So the law is in favor of the tenant? And this law is in favor of everybody because the, the man who is a landlord today, tomorrow his student could become tenants. Do you understand that? It, and um, it is in favor of everybody. You know, the, 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 the main thing you must understand here is that when you buy a property, property investment is a long-term investment. You, you cannot recover. The, what is wrong is that in Nigeria, most landlords want to recover their investments within two years, four years. Hence, they're talking about payment of rent in two years in advance. So, no, it's a long-term investment for everybody. You know, if you're if you're buying property, so you buy it and it could it could be there for for years, you know, your lifetime and beyond your lifetime. That is the sense of investment in property. But if you're if if landlords are buying with the hope of of recovering or recouping their money from tenants within five years, ten years, this is wrong. That's why they are so desperate. Landlords are so desperate to charge. A, uh, rents uh, the way they are charging. But look, we turn our tenants into beggars. We turn Nigerians into beggars, into thieves. Many people are going to steal, lie, you know, um, do many bad things just to raise money for uh, rent for a year or two years. And we have no self-respect for ourselves anymore. So I would want a situation where people are able to pay as they go. A credit system, system. I mean, which we don't have, anyways. Yeah, but it has to be. Which means that we must have a system. With, you know, a national database, for example, is required to achieve this, where everybody is known, record of everybody is known, whether you are disabled or you are able, you are working, or unemployed. Everybody system must be known. Then, of course, every property must be registered in Nigeria, whether every land must be registered, whether it is developed or not developed. You know, uh, if you do that, government will be able to manage all this as well. Many people, are, uh, I mean, like Nigeria is not run very well because the record system in Nigeria is not reliable, it's not dependable. We, we how many, if you go to embassies, if you go to embassies in Nigeria, most of them don't accept record documents from Nigeria as readily uh, you know, uh, cogent or um, honest uh, documents. No, they, but they, they believe that we, we, we forge everything, we create documents. You know, that's because we have no records. Mm. But of course, with a NIN now, with a BVN and other things coming on board, gradually it's all been, but we need to consolidate all that. Yeah. We need to consolidate all that within the next few years. Uh, th there's another one that was quite, uh, uh, most of your motions and bills seems a bit controversial. But I mean, uh, maybe because of your background in education, sometimes you're thinking uh, from a global perspective, you are asking for an urgent need for a national dialogue with separatist groups in Nigeria, according to you, to genuinely and amicably resolve all issues. So you're talking about groups like IPOP, for example. Yes, yes. Yes. What exactly are you asking the federal government to do with them? Well, not just federal government. I'm not asking federal government to convene a national conference. I'm asking National Assembly, Senate, and House of Representatives to become the platform for this dialogue. We can convene a national dialogue that occurs across every group. There will be traditional rulers. You have um, governors representing uh, representatives. You have local government representatives. You have uh, students, uh, bodies. You have all sectors represented. 
But beyond that, you also have the key agitators. Who are the agitators? You have the Boko Haram. You have IPOB. You have ESN. You have Yodidowa and, and the rest of them. Let's hear them out. Let's know what they're asking for. Let's try and find a way forward. Enough of killings. So much has been spent. You know, they talk about connectors in Nigeria. It's a new language in Nigeria. Everybody's talking about uh, spending money uh, to kill them. Kill who? They are Nigerians. You go about killing them, bombing them. And then they are not relenting. They are recruiting more people. They are also killing our soldiers, killing our policemen, killing our innocent people, kidnapping, and, you know, bandits everywhere. You know, but most of these people are doing what they are doing because of the economy. It boils down to the economy. If the economy is sustainable, if the economy is good for everybody and the system is fair to all, you're not gonna find people uh, fighting to become independent or, or fighting that the system is bad. You know, so what I'm proposing is that National Assembly, over a three month period, we convene a platform where all groups are to be heard and let's try and get everybody to be heard. Many years ago, the Taliban's were killing Americans, killing Russians, until America said, look, we, 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 let's talk to, they began to talk to them, they talked to the Taliban's. I'm sure you know that. Mm -hmm. they, had, they had to talk to Taliban, and Taliban eventually left, uh, sorry, uh, America and Russia, uh, finally, over time, left uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. The same thing with uh, Britain and um, the IRA. I'm sure you remember the IRA, the Irish Repo Republican Army. It was a, a, a fight between Christians, Catholics, and, and Protestants. And um, the, the, the young Irish men and women were planting bombs in London, in, in, in UK, killing people in hotels, in uh, conference centers, in uh, the airports and train stations. They were doing that because they, they, were, they were not happy with the way the British government has kind of trying to take over Northern, Northern Ireland. I'm sure you know the history. Yeah. You know? But eventually, I think it was a guy called Terry Waits that said, look, enough of these killings because the British will go and look for them in their homes, they arrest their families, they arrest their mm -hmm. friends. Um, they will in turn, so there were new recruits every time. Because you, you, know, you can't kill ideas. The anger has been there. And you can't kill ideas with the barrels of gun. Mm -hmm. You can't. You know, you've got, young ones will also always be born and, and they are told the story of what their parents went through and so they will carry guns. So do you think so that the story of eventually, Biafra, for example, event, eventually, eventually, the British government agreed to sit down with the IRA, the political wing, mm -hmm. and they did. And they resolved, and eventually, the fightings and the killings stopped. And some of those who were advocating, advocating for killings in, before were elected into the parliament, and they are now representing the people, the Irish people mm -hmm. in Ireland, Northern Ireland. So we can do the same thing in Nigeria. We can do the same thing. We can, we're all Nigerians, whether you are IPOB or ESN or Boko Haram or whatever it is. You know, um, I, I, once, I once went to um, Ademoa State uh, uh, to see a friend of mine uh, who is now late, um, uh, Ahmed Gulak, who was killed uh, uh, in a worry. In a worry. I went to his uh, village, I was a host, and then I saw a beautiful landscape behind when I woke up in the morning. And I decided to take a drive. And he told me, you can't go there. That, that place is occupied by Boko Haram. And I said, I was, I'm going to go. I wasn't uh, in National Assembly then. I, I wasn't worried about meeting other Nigerians who are expressing the veteran views. So I went there. I didn't go with a policeman. He, told, he said I shouldn't go with a policeman, with a driver. In less than, less than 30 minutes of driving, we were stopped by group of young men that identified themselves as Boko Haram. And they asked what I was doing. I told them, I'm a tourist, I, I love the environment, I, I want to see. They say, no, this part is not Nigerian, that they've taken over this, this part. That if, if not that they know me, or uh, they know my face, that they, they would have taken me, and, and, but the, I should go back. So I've come across them, and, uh, but what they told me was that 
that I want to be part of Nigeria. That the Boko Haram Oh, yes. They tell me that they don't want to be part of Nigeria, that Nigeria is uh, unfair to them, uh, that Nigeria has, has uh, there are so many moralities in Nigeria, you know, that governments are not accountable. So bring the leadership of such people to the National Assembly through a conference to be organized by National Assembly. Let's hear them. Let's find that exactly. Because uh, that is a part of Nigeria, that bet between Nigeria and Cameroon, that these guys say it's still part of Nigeria. You know, but that's in, in Gulag. They call it that area, Gulag, or, and whatever else. You know? So there are many, many um, uh, things that needs to be done. In security is a major problem in Nigeria. But we can't keep on pretending that we can win the war by killing uh, all those insurgents or militants. Um, we can't. We just need to dialogue. That's all I'm saying. Enough of killings and enough of money being spent in buying weapons and buying uh, uh, fighter jets and all that. Look, have you spoken to, to soldiers? M many of them are also tired. They want to, to, to be alive. They want to be alive for their families, for their wives, for their children. So what are we talking about? I'm, I'm particularly interested in, because uh, you, I mean, Delta State is, has a very interesting mix of different cultures, had, uh, to the Southeast, to the part of uh, Ijo and all of you. Yeah. And the Biafra situation and the, 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 the civil war, it does look like that lesson perhaps may not have sunk deep enough for the uh, for the uh, for the modern world uh, of for the uh, an average younger Igbo man and that, that thinking and that uh, mentality about what transpired at that time that is causing almost every ten years the agitation about the Afra. You think? Uh, w w let, let me ask you: What best ways do you think we can quell? that kind of agitation in the minds of an, a young uh, 20 25 30 year old uh, southeasterner i just told you dialogue with them talk with them find out why they're doing what they're doing what is it that nigerian government is doing that is, is that is distasteful to them what are the injustices they're crying about you know so thinking that you're going to kill all that kill them go into the forest and kill them and, and uh, go to their homes and arrest their mothers and, and their wives. And it's, it's not going to stop it. The, these are very fundamental um, uh, concerns uh, for them. If, if they want to be, majority of them, I'm sure, want to be part of a bigger Nigeria. Nigeria is a big place, and um, I love Nigeria. I'm sure they all love Nigeria. They all love, you know, the, the strength in in, uh, diversity. In, in diversity and, and, and unity, you know. So they are clamoring for justice. Mm. They yeah. are, they, there's, 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 in the state of Nigeria uh, has not been fair to them, they, they claim. And so what we need to do is to hear those areas of the concerns in an open dialogue uh, you know, platform where everybody is given the opportunity to speak and speak candidly, you know. I think when that is done, you hear that, and then they will answer your questions. You, you, you said something that probably will interest most of our young people. Uh, you were asking for the establishment of social media platform offices. Oh, yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, it's a very simple thing. Uh, um, most of the social media platforms are American based. I don't know, they're American owned. But they have offices in UK, they have offices in France, they have offices in Japan. And there has to be a system where we don't just allow our space in Nigeria to be occupied by unknown organizations. The first thing that must be done is to have all these offices, all these companies have the offices in Nigeria, whether it's uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram or uh, whatever else they are, they must have offices in Nigeria. And these offices will do the following things. One, they will create jobs for our young ones. And two, they will begin to pass knowledge to our young ones. Three, they will, they will pay taxes to the government. Four, if there are complaints against 
those platforms arising from fake news, then it would be easy for the lawyers to write to their offices in Nigeria and say, look, retract this or we'll take you to court. Or they'll, or they'll go to court like others, isn't it? They'll have the opportunity to, to, to go to, for, for litigation. But like now, they have no offices here. So if you, they don't pay taxes, they, they, our youths don't earn anything from them, really not directly, you know. Um, and if there are litigations, you need to hire a lawyer in America to go to court in America, and which is very expensive. So making sure that all those platforms have their offices here in Nigeria is just to do what other civilized nations do. It's not, so, it's not different from what is happening in America, or sorry, in Britain or, or France or elsewhere. You know, a, a company like Facebook, I, I'm sure if you Google, you probably see that they have two or three offices in England. Why did they have those offices in England? Why did the English, British government make them to have offices in UK and not leave them to have all the offices in, uh, in America? Uh, one of the other things that I, I, I think that was, it's quite interesting, you are asking colonial powers that the must come together to apologize to Africans yeah. on historical injustice, exploitation, and neocolonialism that have left an indelible mark on the continent. And you are asking them to pay repatriations of at least $5 trillion to Nigeria as a pathway to urge healing and restoration. Yeah. I mean, you've lived in the UK. Mm. You think that is possible, for example? It is very possible. It is very possible. Um, um, and by the way, you know, asking for five trillion dollars. Uh, so we, we need to amend the prayer to make it a five trillion uh, naira because the money we paid to us in naira, they, they will look for naira to pay us, isn't it? In line with- But would they plan. agree to do that? Look, they will if we push for it. But African countries must come together. You know, we have not really gone beyond what our forefathers did in the, in the 50s and 60s, where we, they were asking for political independence after s s the hundreds of years of, of slavery. You know, but if you've lived in England, you will see that there is a lot of, or in America or in other country, you will see that Africa is still a third world country. You know, many of those countries still believe that uh, they are superior. They still believe that they are superior. Because we buy everything from them, we look up to them. They set up IMF and the United Nations for, for, the, for, our, for, for, for the third world countries, for Africa particularly, black Africa particularly. You know, how many of um, European countries do you hear of IMF? or um, World Bank, you know, giving loans or doing things. So they're just set up. They think they, they can manage us, that we, we, are, we are not as clever as we should be. Or, or they, they, they have perpetually, or they feel that we should be where we are for the world to continue to exist. We have, as a continent, you know, suffered generations of untold discrimination, you know. You tell me, in, in what, what world would anybody come to think, oh, my, for, my forefathers were sold like commodities. They were raped and at, at will. They were all the natural resources that they have. They, Look, it's a historical injustice that I am talking about. And you must redress it. The average African might not really begin to understand the level of injustice that are perpetrated over time. But it, they are there, you know. So we, we need to ask for the first world, as they call themselves, to pay for the centuries of injustice done to Africa in, in so many areas, you know, in so many areas. Right. Senator, uh, you had loggerheads with some state governors mm -hmm. over a consultancy job that you did 
in uh, in the repayment of the Paris Club funds. Mm -hmm. Have that been settled? We're on the verge of it. We're talking. At last, we're talking. You know, um, and I'm glad you asked that question because, I, you know, before I began the the fight for the for Nigeria to exit from the Paris and London club loans, many people thought it was impossible. Many so you started that push? Of course I started it. I met with Abbasanjo a few times. He called the Minister of Finance then, Ngoziwala. We had discussions with DMO and I went to court in, in London against most of the lenders. Um, people like P2B came to my office at least two times in London in pursuit of that. You know, he followed me around quite, quite often. Uh, Boni Haruna, uh, most of the governors, uh, most of the governors were there supporting the whole process. So you did process. that in your own personal capacity? Of course, yes. As a private citizen? As a lawyer, as a, as a solicitor. So what were you looking for? Why would you take, is it a, as because, a public interest or as what? No, because of commercial purpose. Because, because a state like Adamawa State and, and Taraba, the former Gongola state gave me documents that showed me uh, beyond any doubt that they had overpaid their loans. Their loans. And so I had to apply it to all the other states. And by the time I approached federal government, the list of indebtedness of all the states showed an alarming indebtedness by, like Abia state was owing, according to that document, 2000 and 2004-2005 publication by DMO, that document showed that Abia State was owing about five five hundred and something million dollars. Um, showed that Delta State was owing about three hundred and something, uh, and um, all the states were owing according to the federal government figures. By the time I engaged my consultants, forensic accountants, chartered accountants inquiry agents that we came together and put our heads together and were able to establish that no state in Nigeria was owing. That instead, they were owed refunds and those refunds should start. So three things that Obasanjo did, which I will always remain grateful, was three things. One, to exit Nigeria from those loans. Two, to stop deductions from the various states. And three, to start refunding local governments and states. Local government was even worse because they didn't borrow any money. And yet, you were taking money belonging to the three tiers of government to service some of I those loans. Yes. I, I mean, so uh, Nigeria governments in the federating units and the local government would have been paying all of these loans mm -hmm. for a year on end. Yes. Years on end. Yes. But, uh, uh, but, uh, but as I said, the president of Sanjo was very, was a listening president. So by the time I met with him a few times, and he, he, he bought into the idea. And Are there Nigerians mm -hmm. behind these? Was it like a plot to, to, to make the state government overpay what they, what they, you what can, they owed? You, you can say that because um, I will just give you one instance. There was an instance where Adamawa State was meant to have borrowed about uh, 300 and something million uh, dollars to build a hotel, Yola International Hotel in Yola. By the time we wrote to the supposed lender in Austria and we had a meeting with them, they said, sorry, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't give any loan to any state in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, we don't give loans to any to African countries, let alone a state in Nigeria. You know, so yes, there are some, uh, well, a lot of conspiracy, um, you, can, you can say that, uh, that led to the continuous deductions and, and mismanagement of, of those money. And of course, there were some Nigerians involved. Um, but these are a, a bigger issue. But I am happy that I did it when I did it. And it, we achieved the results because look, states got all their refunds. Um, uh, local governments got all the refunds. Uh, federal government exited from those loans. And the only issue was just the payment of my fees, which they are working on now. So that those who say those fees are humongous. Yes, but uh, that was it. 
I was not paid to do the work. So it was I, part I, of the deal that when these funds are refunded, it all retained, you get your money. All written, I was it was on contingency basis. The, the NGF mm -hmm. as a block fought uh, the attorney general at that time. Uh, and, and there are those and, who believe that you were in collusion with the attorney general and, office and, and, to be able to get those monies. And uh, attorney general, it's attorney general for Nigerians. And uh, the, the concern was, was that justice will be done. And so if you go through the documents and you see, well, NGF was never part of the picture. NGF was never part of the picture. But by the time they, some of the, my money began to come in, they were diverted to NGF. That was, the, that was the issue I had with the NGF. You know, by the time my own fee, because we, we had agreement that the money due to me will be deducted as source. NGF, even, I, I took them to court because I didn't know when the, most of the money began to come in. By the time I realized what was happening, I think I was abroad when it happened, and I, I had to return. By the time I, I came in, NGF had taken uh, some of that money when they were not part of what I was doing. I, of course, I met Yari, who was the, uh, the chairman of uh, NGF at the time, gave him all the documents, told him all that, that had, we had done over the years since 2005. I'm talking about 2017 mm -hmm. or so when Yari became uh, involved. And, uh, you know, just to imagine that NGF, that we're never part of, part of it, will now come and say, look, uh, we will manage your, your money for you. No, they cannot manage. Uh, Do you feel money. betrayed and unjustly Of course, yes, treated. by the system of Nigeria, by, by governors at that time. Do you regret yeah. your action of taking this? No, no, no. Because no, of no, what no, has no, happened no, to no, you? No, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't regret it because I will still get my, pay, my, my, my money at You're the end. You're very confident. Of course, yes, I will. I will. You know, the, the governors, some of the governors are reasonable. Some of the ones at that time were unreasonable. They were, they were, they were dishonest, uh, to say the least. Um, but they knew what happened. They knew that I stopped federal government from making further refunds, they, uh, further deductions from their monthly allocations. They knew I caused federal government to start refunding them. They knew all that. The documents are there. You know, they knew I went to court in London on behalf of the state. They knew I went to court in Nigeria on behalf of the state. They knew I went to court in Nigeria on behalf of local governments. I got judgments. No other, no other Nigerian could claim to do that. None. Mm. No. Senator, as we wrap up this conversation on a lighter note, though, um, you become, uh, you were in the National Assembly, you're coming back uh, also, attracted a lot of attention. Ah, Senator, Honorable Ned Nwoko, now Senator Ned Nwoko, and he seemed to have uh, gotten, in fact, a few more uh, uh, attention and popularity amongst younger folks, perhaps largely because of your wife, who is very popular with younger people mm -hmm. and those, I mean, being a Nollywood uh, star. Uh, how does that feel with you? How does that, what, how does what feel? The, the fact that you have a more younger uh, uh, supporters of younger people who are following you keenly. Well, and that yeah, supports well, largely, you can credit to your wife. Well, that is life, you know. We just do what we have to do. And um, uh, I am uh, happy that uh, um, the attention is uh, not on me. So it's on my wife, you know. <laughs> you know. I mean, there are pictures of uh, both of you so at functions, and uh, I mean, there was a picture of her when she went to a market, tried to disguise, but she couldn't disguise. That's because uh, you know she's such a star that uh, she can she can go work work freely um, anywhere without uh, uh, the um, uh, attention from from her followers. She has massive followership in Nigeria. Uh, do you pay her for for that for the for the advantage she's giving you? Well, because it will add to your political popularity, though. Well, uh, well it's a family. <laughs> it's a family. <laughs> what did you see, anyways? Because when we look at the age disparity, you must have seen something. How do you mean? Since, since, since I mean, so well, you you must have been a man of vision to be able to cite a woman and say, "I see something in this woman to marry her." Well, I I, I married her because. I mean, for her particularly, I married her because she is from my place. I, I wanted a wife from my place, and I was looking for uh, the right person. 
and and by the time I met her, I, I knew she was the one. Um, you know, uh, if you must hear this, um, I I know that I I knew that I, I wanted because I was under pressure from a family. You know, for my people to marry from your own family or from her family. From my family, I was under pressure to marry from my place, uh, from the traditional rulers, from the from them generally. You know, um, and, uh, and 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 the, I had criteria. I had criteria of who, who uh, that you have the the, the check uh, the, the the boxes. Yes, and, and she ticks all the boxes. Yes, of course. Oh, and, these boxes? And, and more, you know. So, I I just needed somebody who would fit into those bills, you know. Um, you know, I needed somebody who is uh, independent-minded. You know, I need somebody who is who has a, a career. Uh, you you might even want to know that before her. My uncles had brought some local girls from say you must marry this or must marry. but I said no, you know they don't meet what I want. You have a taste. Oh yes, <laughs> you know. But uh, above all I said to them, Look, I must I, I can't marry I, I I come from a royal family. We have our our requirements, we have our traditions. I can't marry a woman who is not a virgin, you know. I can't, I wouldn't. And um and and so when I met uh Regina, I asked her, I asked her immediately, you know, if she was, and she said, yes, she was, it's okay. And uh, so I, I, I told her, look, if you are one, and if that is an important part of what I, what must be done. And, and secondly, you must also be willing to do sports. I love sports, mm. you know. Every member, is too. every member of my family must do sports. She said to me, what sport? I said, you must uh, play tennis, you must swim. Everybody swims, everybody plays tennis. You know, so she told me, why not? She would do it, and that's it. You know, so, and she does even more than that now. Wow. Was it love at first sight? I liked what I saw, you know, as I told you. you know, you, well, there are many girls who look the same, but be, behind or beyond them, there are many things that you're, you're looking for. So she met those conditions, and that was it. So if you met Regina again, you will marry her again? Oh, yeah. Yes, anytime, mm -hmm. any day. You know. Distinguished. It's a very good pleasure having to talk to you mm -hmm. and uh, having to talk about so many issues. Thank you so much, indeed, for sharing you. your time and your thoughts with us. Thank you so much, indeed. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that is our show for today. From his personal life to his politics, Senator Ned Nwoko has left a lot for us to chew on. In all, we are learning more and more about how much lawmaking costs Nigerians, what the pros and cons of civilians bearing firearms are, what will it mean for homeowners who are mandated by law to only ask for the monthly rent is against the one-year payment arrangement that is currently obtainable across the country. Lawmaking is never that simple. That is why these bills and ideas are subjected to processes and proper scrutiny. In the final analysis, may all be to the benefit of Nigeria and Nigerians. Thank you all for staying with us on this episode of the MyCon Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow us on all social media platforms. I'll see you next time. I'm Shawan Kimale. Goodbye for now. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Mike on Podcast with Shayono Kimbaloy. Mike on Podcast for the independent mind.